Shalom lekulam, and welcome back everybody to our Hebrew Alphabet Beginner Reading Pre-Module. And we have progressed through the course all the way to lesson number 10. So today we're going to be introducing three new consonants you've not seen before. First one is called Tzadi, and there is a final form to the Tzadi called Tzadi Tzofit. There's a Kof, and there is a Resh. So you want to take a moment right now, if you haven't already done so, to click on the link and get your downloadable student document, which will be tracing tablature pages, so that while I am giving this lesson, you'll be able to pause at the appropriate places and do some of the tracing of these new consonants and follow along with me as I make my way through lesson number 10. We'll see you in the next placard. Consonant number 18 of 22 is pronounced tsade. You can try saying that with me. Tsade. Tsade is pronounced like the T-S in the word nuts. So in the English language, we really don't have any letter in the English alphabet that would convey the sound T-S or T-Z, that sound as in nuts. This consonant, as I mentioned, does take a different form whenever it appears. So whenever it appears at the very end of a word, the tsade will look like this. It's one of the handful of letters that will drop beneath the baseline. That's one thing that can tip you off that you're dealing with a letter that has a final form. Most of the letters that have final forms dip below the baseline, though not in every single case, because we know with the mem, the mem does not. But there are a number of other letters that do. The nun sofit drops below the baseline. The kaf sofit drops below the baseline. The pe drops below the baseline. And so you can add to that small collection of letters that have sofit forms, final forms, the tsade. I'd like to draw your attention down at the toward the bottom of the screen where we have our tracing template. So because there are two forms of the letter tsadi, we are going to have two different templates. You're going to have two different segments on your practice pages that you can begin to perform the tracing exercises and begin writing out your own tsades and filling up that page. Let's start with the regular tsadi, the non-final form which would appear any place in a Hebrew word except the final letter of the word. I'm going to start up here. I'm going to draw a line down. So just like you're beginning to draw an X, or capital X in English, I'm going to go down, and with an unbroken stroke, you're going to go over to the left. Then you're going to finish this with the third component by starting up at the top of the opposite side, like I said, just like you're drawing an X, this would be the other part of the X, it's just you're going to go halfway instead of going the full way, and that is a very beautiful, very lovely tzadeh. Let's turn our attention to the tzadeh sofi. This is even easier, it just has two strokes. Start at the top. Make sure that we go beneath what I call the baseline, which is reflected in this black line here. And the second stroke at, a, at an angle. The same type of angle as an X would be formed. And there you have your tzadi. Here I've got a picture of, just known in the Jewish faith as a charity box. They would say tzedaka. They have a copy of the Hebrew version of this word. So the root of this word is actually the word for righteousness and so there's a connection between giving funds money and it doesn't always have to be money but in the jewish faith staka box is to receive coins for those that are in need and you would give and drop the coin into the little staka box and some people would prefer to say Zadaka, but if we were to technically pronounce this in the correct way because there is a shva beneath the tzade, a shva is not a full vowel, so it's not tzadaka, it's tzdaka. Tzdaka is how you would pronounce that. 
I know there was a day and time where coins actually had value, and it meant something when you put coins. And, of course, we live in a day where the U.S. currency has been so devalued through money printing that coins are virtually worthless today. So we're probably going to have to change the manner in which we do things and leave room for, I guess you could fold up a $100 bill and stick it into the tzedakah box. Jewish people on Shabbat, they can't carry money forbidden to carry because that is a violation of the Torah. And so they will have to give at other uh, opportune times in terms of giving monies to their synagogue. All right, that being said, we're going to move on now to our next letter. Okay, the next letter is the 19th letter of the alphabet. And it should encourage you because you see the 22, we are approaching the end. And this is exciting because once we finish this, we'll be able to graduate from the newbie schnoobie alphabet program and begin the next pre-module, which will be learning the 16 essential drills. So I'm very excited to get into that material. But let's focus here momentarily on the consonant, which is consonant number 19. This is pronounced kof. You try saying that. Kof. Kof makes the sound of the Q in queen. It is one of the letters that drops below the bass line. So this is not a final form letter, but it is like some of the final forms in that it drops beneath the bass line. Here we have the letter Kof again with a cute little picture of a monkey. You might ask, well, why is there a picture? Why has David included a picture of that cute little monkey? It is because Kof is not only a Hebrew letter in the alphabet, Kof is actually a word in Hebrew, like many of the letters in the alphabet are actual words. So here we have Kof. This would be the spelling of monkey in Hebrew. And it has the letters Kof. The vowel cholamalei, a full cholam vowel. And then uh, this is a letter that we learned just recently called face or feet, final fe. And you would pronounce this word kof. So this is a kof. This is a monkey. Let's practice our tracing. So we're going to begin up top here and come across horizontally. And we're going to come down at an angle. And the second part would be just one straight vertical line down. And just note that you are coming beneath the baseline. And that's one of the ways this letter really, it stands out typically from the other letters that are around it. Most letters do not drop beneath the baseline. And the kof does. So that's the letter kof. Moving on now to the Resh, it's the final letter that we're covering today, so introducing three new consonants, and also um, the one of the consonants that we've covered has a Sufit form, so really there are four different letter images that you will have to memorize and practice on your template paper. Resh is the 20th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This is one of the letters that is particularly difficult for English speakers because it does come from the back of the throat. It's known as a guttural. And there's two ways that this letter can be pronounced, and that's Israelis. So Israelis, depending on who you are, how you were raised, like in some families, a mom will say it one way, and then their kid will say it another way. And so I think it's important that as we're learning these, we give grace to our co-students and people that we may meet that are also studying classical Hebrew biblical Hebrew, that may say things slightly different, and it is not does not mean instantaneously, they're wrong, or they were taught wrong. It just, no, there's different ways of saying things, and we get that in our country as well, depending on what part of the country, whether it's the Northeast or the Southwest or the Deep South, things are said incredibly different, and it's all English, and it's just different ways of saying English. It's much the same way in Israel. Israel is a nation of immigrants who come from all over the place, all the countries of the world. And they all say Hebrew slightly different. They give grace in Israel to people because they understand that 
you know, I was an immigrant too at one point and I know what it's like. And so they pretty much can tell what you're saying, even if you say it slightly differently, just like over here, uh, we can usually tell what people are saying, though I, I, I do admit I did have a conversation briefly on the phone with a woman from the Deep South many years ago, and I couldn't tell what she was saying. Her, her English was so radically different. It was like I was getting about 30%, which was scary because I knew English, you know, so. <laughs> All right, so back to race. So um, English speakers would say race, so from the front of the mouth, rrr, rrr, like um, a young child playing with a car, rrr, rrr, making the, those sounds rrr, from the front and your lips rrr, go out. Rrr. And then Israelis, there's two ways that they would pronounce rash. One would be like a trill, like in the Spanish languages. They would say rash. They would roll the R, rash, rash. So that would be acceptable. And then there's the back of the throat uh, that is rash. And I have a note down here that if you're going to pronounce it from the back of the throat, it's the same location that you would pronounce the letter G. So if you want to practice doing it this way, I think it's good that, you know, we learn the guttural approach. We also learn how to trill it. Um, you know, that, that would be great. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of work because there's a lot of unlearning we have to do. We're used to, in English, pronouncing the R's from the front of the mouth. Ooh, ooh, run. Ooh. Lips come out. And so the way that the Jewish people would pronounce Reish. Notice there's no lips. The lips are not jutting out. If it's from the back of the throat, it's reish. My lips aren't even moving. Reish, it's coming from the throat. And if it's a trill, it's reish, reish. Lips aren't protruding out. So you can see that visually. It's different how, how it sounds. But if you want to practice the guttural one, uh, practice saying g, g. So the, the G sound, g. But instead of using the G sound, try 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 forming the sound for R, but from the position that the G is normally sounded from in the back of the throat or the guttural. G, reish, reish. And that's one way that you can begin to retrain yourself and practice. And um, this will take more practice than I believe any other letter in the alphabet. It will take some time for some, it takes them years and they never quite get it. But um, I think it's it's worthy pursuit because we want to be reading Hebrew properly. Finally, I share down here that it represents either an evil or a poor person who is bowed over. So notice just the shape of this letter. Rabbis have kind of filled in the blanks at times with some meanings that these letters take. And so the Reish, they see it as being bent over, but also many of the words in the Hebrew Bible that begin with resh, certainly not all of them, because you have a word like rosh, which is head, rosh, uh, but there are many like rasha, yeah, rasha is evil, rashaim is, uh, is an evil person, Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the rashaim, and so this letter is also used for uh, a poor person and many other things. A um, number of those things are quite negative. And so the rabbis have seen in the formation of this letter an image that represents something that is negative, that's either evil or bad or represents poverty. That's obviously not a good thing, poverty. So hopefully that's helpful to you. We're going to go to our worm's eye view placard. All right, so we have a picture here, and this may be a picture of something that you are completely unfamiliar with. And this is, in Yiddish, you would say grager, and it's very appropriate, actually, that I'm covering this lesson right now because it is the eve of Purim, 2023. So the festival, uh, the holiday of Purim, Purim, meaning lots, where the entire story of Esther is read. Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther, is unrolled. And it's the most lively, festive holiday on the Jewish religious calendar. And people dress up in costumes and 
Uh, we have hosted a number of Purim parties at our own home over the years. I'll actually uh, grab a grogger. A grogger is a noisemaker. I'm going to grab mine right now. So here is a grogger. See if that will show there on my camera. Okay, so... Um, Okay, I'm going to go back a little bit. There it is. Okay. So it's got a handle. And this is what a grogger sounds like. Wow. That's a loud one. I've always enjoyed collecting Judaica. It's a lot of fun for me. But what is the connection between grogger and Purim? So the grogger is what the Jewish people utilize to actually obey or perform a positive commandment. And it is the commandment that the Israelites were to, quote, blot out the name of Amalek. Blot out the name of Amalek. And so Amalek were, the Amalekites were responsible for killing the elderly, the sick, the young, that were kind of stragglers when Israel departed Egypt in ancient times, and they were fleeing Egypt for the promised land. And so the Amalekites were bloodthirsty. They were ruthless. And they were like the take no prisoners variety. And they were just killing for the sake of killing, much like the spirit that's behind the abortion industry today, where they prey on the most innocent, the ones who should be afforded the greatest protections are the ones that are actually being targeted for slaughter. So that is a murderous spirit. And Hashem feels very strongly about that spirit, about those who commit those types of crimes against humanity. And he has memorialized in the Torah a commandment that the name of Amalek be blotted out. If you read the story of Esther, you'll find that the negative character in the plot, who is Haman, you study his genealogical background, he is a descendant of Amalek. And he's actually in the direct line of descent of when King Saul was commanded by the prophet Shmuel, Samuel, to kill Agag. He did not. He disobeyed that commandment, actually lost the kingship over it. And Agag is a direct descendant forefather of Haman. So it's Haman the Agagite. But if you research back further in the genealogical listings, the Agagites come from Amalek. And so it is appropriate, it is correct to say Haman was actually an Amalekite. So when the story is read in its entirety in the synagogue, in the shul, during the festival of Purim, the people who are participating will have groggers, and if they didn't bring their own, many shuls will provide complimentary grogger for you to use while you are there celebrating. And every time that Haman's name appears in the text, and I think it's it's a lot, I think it's something like 64 times, everybody will boo, hiss, stamp their feet, get out their grogger, their ra'ashan, and begin cranking. So you can imagine it takes a long time getting through this story of Esther when everybody is grogging and depending on how long they grog for, it, it's uh, it's comical, but it's also, it's it takes a perseverance. If you are the person that is leading that forum reading, it is quite challenging to get through, but it's all taken in lighthearted to suggest, but there is a truth behind it all of blotting out the name of Amalek. So I just wanted to share that, that that might be interesting for those that are new. Forgive me, it looks like I'm missing a little dot on the shin here. So the Ashan is a rattle in a Hebrew or a noisemaker in the German Hebrew dialect known as Yiddish. It is called a grager. So those are synonyms, they're just different languages that mean the exact same thing. What you'll find is that there are uh, ornate pieces of Judaica for the celebration of the feast and the holy days. Um, there are dozens of pieces of Judaica that are attached to all of these special celebrations. And there are some really beautiful ones that are ornate, that are handcrafted. They may contain silver, even gold, uh, that have incredible artistry. So I actually really enjoy That's a hobby of mine is 
is uh, getting to learn more about that, collecting specimens like that. And I don't have anything that's worth like a lot of money. So, uh, but I do have quite a few specimens and I just showed you one of my favorites. Uh, so that's my favorite. Grogger, right, moving on to our tracing template. This is just gonna be very simple. So looking at two strokes, come across, and an unbroken stroke come down and you're done. So that's a simple one. Most of them are, are quite simple, which is good. So that is our reish. So reish is in rashan, the word for rattle or noisemaker. Okay, this concludes lesson 10 in our series. So we're one step closer getting to the, getting to the end, getting to the finish line here. So very exciting. So we've covered today Tzadi, and you can also add Tzadi Tzofit, a completely different form that will need to be memorized, and it will need to be traced individually, separate from the, the normal Tzadi. And then we covered Kov, and then Resh. Hopefully this has been enjoyable and engaging for you. We're going to be conducting, I'll be conducting a reading practice during our next lesson, and we will concentrate on just covering some basic reading including, especially including these three consonants that we've just learned to help solidify that in your minds and how to actually sound these out as they appear in very short monosyllabic and bisyllabic, maybe, uh, maybe a couple trisyllabic words in the next lesson. So we will see you on the other side.